Chefleen here. We're gonna get started at seven o'clock. <laughs> Just figuring out my technological uh, issues here. Oh, you're on there. Oh, great. Both, both are ready. Awesome. Welcome to my home kitchen um, in Harlem. Uh, I'm Chef Lane. We are gonna get started at exactly seven o'clock, so I'm gonna wait for some people to join in. Um, feel free to comment below, ask questions. We have my technological goddess guru, T.T. Lyle, helping me in the background. She doesn't want to be seen, you know, she's too famous. So she's going to be um, reading out the questions that you guys have for me. And I'm very excited to start cooking along here on Real Life Cooking. Um, yeah, what time is it? 6.58? 6.59. So I guess I can rattle off some facts about me since we're in the meantime waiting. Uh, I'm Chef Lean. My name is Kathleen, uh, but I am originally hail from California and I live in New York City. I've lived here for five years. I've been a chef for eight years, despite my youthful appearance. I know, I know. Um, I've worked mainly in private homes. Uh, I went to culinary school, Le Cordon Bleu. I went to UC Berkeley, Go Bears. Um, what happened in the Stanford game last night? Or no, was it the Stanford game? Uh, it was UCLA, oh, so we don't, UCLA, we don't want to talk about it. You're a bear game. too, you should, you know, bear love. But um, I went to UC Berkeley, I graduated in the recession in 09. I couldn't, I didn't know what my passion was. Well, I always knew I loved to cook, so I decided to go to culinary school. Um, culinary school was awesome. I loved every minute of it. I went to school at six in the morning and I was like always wide awake, which is like a huge feat for most people, I'm sure. Um, right out of culinary school, I got a job with uh, Will Smith, amazing celebrity person. And um, from there, I felt like that was a sign that my whole life just like kind of took off. I've been cooking ever since, making a living off of cooking. Every day I walk to work, I'm like, ooh, I just gotta cook these people chicken, how amazing. And this is my new venture. Is it seven o'clock? It is seven o'clock. Woo, seven o'clock, we ready. Um, this is my new venture, Real Life Cooking, because it really is, although I make a living off of cooking for rich and famous and cool people and all I do have to ch cook chicken and salads, um, my real, passion in life is teaching people how to cook. I really want to inspire people at home um, to show you like it's super easy to cook in your own house. That's why I'm in my own house. I really live here. This is not a YouTube set. This is not an Airbnb. This is where I live. Um, I took a lot of work to find this in, in New York City. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I really want to inspire you and show you that it is possible to cook in your own home and real life cooking is going to do that. When it comes to cooking, a lot of people have excuses. I don't have any time, I don't have any money, or, but that's a lie because you eat out, so you have a lot of money. Um, I don't want to do dishes, so, or you just don't want to put in the effort. Now, I'm sorry, all of the above besides effort don't matter, but effort, you really do have to want to cook to be able to cook. Um, but once you know a few techniques, it's gonna be so fun and so easy for you that you're gonna be like, ooh, I love cooking, because you'll save so much money. And I'm gonna teach you ways how to like not have to wash so many dishes, which is awesome. Um, so yeah, basically cooking involves simple techniques and understanding flavors. So throughout this series, I'm going to be teaching you simple techniques that are translatable through different cuisines. Um, I really want to inspire you to play around with your own flavors. I'm not going to ever give you like an exact recipe because we'll never be baking really because I only, I'm trying to keep this 30 minutes, keep your attention. Um, but I want you to play around at home with whatever um, the ideas that I give you. Feel free throughout the whole time to ask questions. That's why I have Titi Lyle, our technological guru over there. Um, she'll interrupt me and if I have some time, I will uh, go ahead and answer your question. If I can't answer your question, I'll research it and get back to you. So please, any culinary question related or non-related down in the box, um, please share this with your friends. And yeah, let's get started with real life cooking. Today, we're gonna be making um, perfect chicken breasts, which sound boring, but you know, chicken breasts are a great thing to just keep in your fridge all the time. We are also are gonna be making a vinaigrette, which is another great thing you can just keep in the fridge for like two weeks at a time. And we are also going to be making a chickpea Greek salad, which is one of my favorite things to do or eat in the summer. It's full of protein, it has feta cheese, amazing. Um, so yeah, those are the things we're gonna be making. Again, ask questions in the box below. Um, like, you know, send me your love, send me your energy. You're not right here in my living room, but I can feel you through the screen. All right, so let's, before we get started, I just wanna talk about some kitchen setup. If you are actually cooking along with me today, I just realized you can't see my cutting board. 
in the Facebook Live. So let's fix that. There you go. Still a little shadowy. All right, perfect. So that leads me to the first thing that you need, a cutting board. Um, it amazes me how many of my friends do not have a cutting board in their home. They're over here struggling cutting on plates. Please buy a cutting board, it costs like $12. Um, so cutting board, first thing you need, dish towel, amazing thing to have unless you wanna use a million paper towels while you are working. Salt and pepper, always great to have on the side while you're cooking so you're not running back and forth. Um, a knife, I keep mine on the wall for, you know, <laughs> in case things get wild around here. Um, but yeah, a knife and not a steak knife that you have in like that little block that's like this big. That's not gonna do anything for you. You need a chef's knife. Um, you can actually find them pretty inexpensively uh, if you don't cook a lot. And I'm gonna have, I'm thinking of doing a whole knife series um, one of these weeks. So if you wanna see that, let me know below. But yeah, a knife. And when you hold your knife, you wanna wrap your hand around this back part. Your thumb is gonna go here and your whole hand is gonna go around that way. And when you chop, you don't chop like this or stab like that, you're not killing anyone. You wanna rock your knife just like this and keep your fingers curled in so you're not gonna cut yourself. So you can just sit here and chop and chop and chop. Anyway, knife, chef's knife, um, find one that works for your hand. Just because it's expensive doesn't mean it's good. You just need to have a good grip on your own knife. Um, final thing that I was going to say, oh, trash can. So. Unless you want to get your exercise walking back and forth to the trash can over and over, um, keep your trash can close. So if you don't want to move your whole trash can to you, um, go ahead and just put a little garbage bowl. Um, Rachel Ray always used to be like, oh, my garbage bowl right here on the counter. Um, so you want to just keep it close. So you don't have to walk back and forth. You're not spilling things, anything of that nature. Um, yeah, so awesome. Let's go ahead and get started. What are we going to start cooking first? Because cooking is all about... Um, order of operations, right? We don't want to cook the thing that's going to be easy and then be waiting around for our chicken to be done. We want everything to be done at the same time. So obviously we're going to start with our chicken. Ta-da! Chicken. Here we go. We have our chicken breasts. I'm also, as I explain my chicken breasts, I'm going to start heating my pan because we want our pan to be super, super hot. My oven is like easy bake oven. It's the only thing I don't like about this apartment, but it's nice and shiny. It looks beautiful. All right, so chicken breast. This is the reason why I didn't want to tell you uh, exact recipe because not everything is equal. So we have two different kinds of chicken breast here. We have our cutlets, which are a little bit thinner. I don't want to touch it quite yet because you know chicken has salmonella. And we have our chicken breast, which is the actual thing that I wanted you to buy. So if you have this, no worries, it's chicken. Chicken is chicken. But um, you're gonna cook it a little less time than your actual chicken breast. Question. Uh, Monique Laurent wants to know what are some good knife brands? Um, so some good knife brands, uh, if you are in the market for a cheaper knife, is a Vic Victor, Victor on, Victor Knox. <laughs> it's about $40. Um, it's actually the knife I have right here. And um, it stays sharp. It's not a lot of work to take care of. If you are looking for expensive knife, your Asian knives are going to be a little more expensive um, than your German knives. But I find German knives are a little more, more durable. Um, so back to our chicken, we are going to go ahead and um, we're going to sear and steam our chicken, which is like a kind of weird way to make chicken. Normally just cook it over the stove top, just back and forth, but that makes your chicken very dry because you're only cooking it on the outside and outside and the inside stays kind of moist and the outside gets very, very dry. So in order to sear our chicken, searing we need super hot pan, that's why we're heating it up behind us and we don't want any moisture on our chicken. So if you're cooking along with me, go ahead and grab a paper towel and pat down your chicken. We wanna remove any of that excess moisture. I'm also gonna grab my tongs and go ahead and flip it around. And we wanna remove all that excess moisture. So when it hits the pan, it's not gonna um, create steam, which is not gonna have that nice browning effect. Next, we're going to season our chicken. So we're just gonna season very, very well. This is like the main thing I notice a lot of home cooks, they like season like this, not even that much salt, like, oh, let me season my chicken. No, your, your chicken can hold, your proteins can have, hold a lot of salt, um, beef especially if you cook beef. So we wanna make sure that we're seasoning our chicken very well. If you season from higher above, you don't just look fancy, but it's actually scientifically proven that you're seasoning your meat a little bit more, or a little bit better, it's distributing a little better. Do you wash the chicken before you start cooking? Hmm, debate of the century. <laughs> this 
is a hard question. I know I do not personally wash my chicken before I start cooking it. Um, there's a huge debate. I've read a lot of different things about it. I'm just seasoning it with salt and pepper, pepper now. Um, but I've heard that like if you wash your chicken in the sink, then you have to be really careful about cleaning your sink because you're just spreading your salmonella around. If you're buying good organic chicken, there's no need. It's not going to have that film on it that probably what most people are washing off. So I would, no, I do not wash my chicken. I don't have any yes or no against it. Please not hunt me down and tell me how you wash your chicken. It's the best thing ever. Um, cooking. <laughs> so yeah, uh, we're going to, um, now that our chicken is seasoned, uh, we want to make sure our pan is nice and hot. The way we do that is touch the pan. Just kidding. Don't do that. Um, you're going to make sure that your pan is hot. Um, you can feel it. My pan is super hot. It's been on high for a long time. I'm using a non-stick scale. I actually can see the smoke coming off of it. And I'm going to just put some oil in there. Oh, it would be helpful if the oil was open. Yep. Mm -hmm. First step of using olive oil, opening it. Perfect. All right, so I'm, I never heat my pan with oil in it because if I walked away from this pan, say I just forgot and kept talking and talking and talking, um, this is a lot more dangerous than just heating a regular pan. Also, if you heat oil, it can become like weirdly taste and flavored. It gets too hot. So oil in the pan after. And then we're going to just put our chicken nice woo, sizzle. That is the noise we want to hear. Obviously, like I said, these two pieces are not going to cook equally. So now that I put my chicken in the pan, I'm not gonna touch it. I'm going to resist the urge to touch it. A lot of home chefs are like, ooh, what's happening in there? What's, what's going on? Um, but when you move your chicken around, you're creating steam and you're not going to actually get that nice brown color. That brown color is actually flavored. It's called the Maillard reaction. And it's when the sugars are reacting inside of the protein and it creates like deeper, darker flavors. So you want the browner your chicken, not burnt, not burnt, but the browner your chicken is, the more flavor it's gonna have. And because we're doing the searing and steaming method here, um, we want the first side to be really nice and brown so it has that nice flavor. So I'm gonna let that go for like two to three minutes. And then I'm gonna peek under it. But yeah, for now, we'll just let it go. And while it's going, I'm going to start, or we're going to start, because I know you're all cooking along at home, on our vinaigrette. Now, because I put that little piece in, that little piece of chicken, it's really not even going to need the searing and steaming effect. So I'm going to just flip that over now. But not my big piece, just my little piece. Oh, look at all that color. Let me bring it over to you. Drip all over my kitchen. Woo, dripping all that oil. See how beautiful? <laughs> flip it over and let that keep cooking. Now, for our vinaigrette, we need a bowl, a whisk. Uh, we're going to need some red wine vinegar, mustard, oh let me not put it in front of you so you can actually see, a garlic clove, one clove of garlic, and the olive oil again. How easy is that? Simple, right? So I think I'm going to flip over my bigger piece of chicken now. Should be nice and brown. Oh yeah, looks like the color I wish I was all summer long. <laughs> not, not me. I, was, I didn't get enough sun this summer. Said. All right, so now that we flip the chicken to the other side, I'm actually going to add a little bit of water. Ooh, my sink is working correctly. Maybe about a fourth of a cup, not too much water. I'm also going to turn down the heat before I add in the water because otherwise it'll be like, Shh, it's still going to do that, but not as bad if you turn down your heat. And then I'm going to cover it with a lid. So, woo! I want you guys to see in here. Oh, you're never going to see because I can't it's tilt pretty. it. It's pretty. I can see it. Yes, it's beautiful. And it's not It's not covering the chicken. It's just sort of like halfway up the chicken. So now I'm going to put it back on the flame and turn my flame onto low. Because at this point, I don't want to boil my chicken. If you boil protein at a rapid, rapid rate, it's going to make the proteins really tight and not taste good at all. So we want to make it a nice, lower, simmer. I never, I never do that. I've never made. You've never made rubbery chicken? I definitely made rubbery chicken. <laughs> I'm pretty sure everyone's made rubbery chicken. Um, but this is a great way because now we're going to bring some moisture back into that chicken. And we still have the color. So it's like a double effect. Now we're going to cover it with our lid. Clearly, this is real life cooking because this lid does not fit this skillet. 
I work in fancy people's homes, but my home is not that fancy. Um, so we're just gonna let that go for about seven minutes. Now, important thing at home, timer. Um, TT Lyle's gonna be our timer today. So TT, around seven minutes, can you let me know? I will let you know at seven minutes. Um, actually, after like two minutes, because you need to take out that small piece. Okay, 7.15, thank yeah. you. All right, so um, set your timer at home. Um, a number, one, a really big thing people at home do is walk away and forget your cooking, like you get into your Netflix or into your conversation, or you just fall asleep. Don't do that, you might burn down your house. Um, but set a timer so you don't forget. Um, you wanna ensure your success when you're cooking and timers and things of that nature really help you. So while our chicken is cooking, we are gonna do our vinaigrette. Now, vinaigrette, why make it from scratch? So many people, I mean, if there's like a whole basically aisle devoted to vinegar or vinegars or salad dressings in the grocery store, um, why should you go through the effort of making it yourself? Well, even me, I'm guilty. Where to go? This is my favorite, my favorite salad dressing of all time, I think, as of now. But let's read the ingredients: soybean oil, white wine, preserved with sulfites. Hmm, those sound great for me. Um, monosodium glutamate, glutamite, mate, mite, garlic, onion, xanthan gum, molasses, calcium, disodium, eta, eta, yeah, what is this stuff? I still eat it, sorry. But it's so much better to make your own vinaigrette at home, and it doesn't take very much time at all. Um, and the great thing about this recipe is it's totally interchangeable, because to make a vinaigrette, you just need three things. You need an acid, which is our vinegar in this case, could be lemon juice. Thank you. Oh, thank you. We're going to take out our chicken onto a clean plate, obviously, because we don't want to put it on our plate that was already cooking chicken. That's disgusting. With our raw chicken. We also want to make sure my flame is on. Okay, perfect. So, vinegar, we need that, or vinegar and acid. So, acid is vinegar, lemon juice, lime juice, orange juice, grapefruit. Combine them all together. Don't do that. But, um, acid. You also need an emulsifier. Emulsifier is gonna bring the two things together, the acid and the oil, they are not friends. It's gonna help bind those together. As you can see in our, like, our store-bought vinaigrette, it has two different layers. That's because the oil and the acid are not combining together. That's why you shake it and it comes together. Um, so in our case, emulsifier is gonna be Dijon mustard. Uh, you could also use mayonnaise and you could also use egg yolk. If you use egg yolk, egg yolk is popular in Caesar dressing, of course. Um, if you use egg yolk, your vinaigrette's not gonna last quite as long because it's an egg yolk, um, but it works just the same. And then you also wanna normally include some sort of allium. Now, allium family is onion, leeks, garlic. It just adds that nice earthy, spicy flavor in the background. Now, first thing that we're gonna do is cut our all allium up. We're just gonna cut off the top and the, ooh, the bottom of the garlic. And then normally, the garlic kind of just peels off. Of course, this garlic, oh, it didn't make a liar out of me. There we go, it peels <laughs> off. They also sell really fancy garlic rollers when I worked at Sir Latab that were really cool. Um, but the knife also does the job. Now, I was a bad host because I did not tell you. Also, I didn't want to intimidate you with all these lists of tools that you need. So I didn't tell you that you should have a microplane. I have that. Yes is the best thing in the yes. whole entire world. And let me tell you why. First, let me show you how you normally chop garlic. Um, Cause we need it to be minced. We don't want big giant chunks of garlic in our dressing cause then I won't be able to kiss anyone for like ever. And I don't think my boyfriend would appreciate that. So we are going to go ahead and slice up our garlic, nice and thin. This is how most people chop garlic. Pa, 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 pa. It's not how you do it. <laughs> you wanna slice your garlic into thin, as thin as you can, planes. So they look like little, Little book or little papers? Yes. Question. How, yes, we have a question. How long can you keep vinaigrettes fresh in the refrigerator if you don't use it? About two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks you can keep your vinaigrettes in the refrigerator. Um, unless you're using egg yolk. That probably like three days I would last at the most. Um, once you have your planks, we are going to go ahead and stack those planks on top of each other. And then we're going to cut little strips. So we have, oh, they stand on my knife when I did this last time. So we have little strips that look like this. Now we're going to align. Yes, question. Yes, does this work with pre-minced garlic? Are you against it? <gasps> oh, oh, I'm oh, so oh, glad I you asked. Who has this? I don't want to say it, you know her. <laughs> I won't say. You'll see later. 
All right. I'm gonna call you out, girl. I'm gonna go. I'm, I'll get to that in a second. Let me finish chopping up this garlic, and we'll get back to the minced garlic. Um. All right. So we're gonna put those little sticks, those little matchsticks that we put together, and we're just gonna put them all together, and then we're gonna chop. Sorry, I don't have like all the cameras surrounding me, so you can see like super high definition. But once you chop those little things, you're gonna have little pieces like this. And then that is when it is appropriate time to gather them all together. This list is in the way at the moment. Gather them all together and then run your knife through them. Now you can create a paste just like that. Um, but alternatively, and I'm so sorry I didn't tell you, I'm still gonna add this in here to my bowl. I'm so sorry I didn't tell you about this. This microplane is the best thing ever. This is actually called a rasp grater. The, this specific brand is microplane. You can take your whole garlic clove Rub it down, rub it down, that sounds funny. <laughs> rub, it, rub it down your garlic. And then you get a super fine paste, just like that. Amazing, right? I love this thing. It saves you so much time. And then to get out your garlic, you just tap it down. And this bothers me every single time I do it because you should never use your knife to scrape something up. You should use a bench scraper, but again, my house, real life, don't have one, costs like $10, but so I've gotten around to buy one. And then you just put it into your bowl as well. Now, minced garlic in the jar. Garlic. I have to sigh on that. Minced garlic in a jar. So what happens with garlic when you are, when it, as art, when once you cut your garlic, it just gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And so that minced garlic is like put with some sort of preservatives that help combat that. So what you end up with is not really garlic flavor at all. It's kind of like, I don't know, like, you know those little things you cough up sometimes? It's kind of like, it reminds me of, I'm sorry, I'm sorry if you use it, but please don't, please. It's worth the effort to grate your own garlic, especially in something as fresh as a vinaigrette. Um, the only acceptable substitute or shortcut for garlic that I will allow, ooh, this has been in my fridge for a while, <laughs> I need to get rid of this, is already peeled garlic. Like, if you need a ton of garlic, already peeled garlic, it's not going to go bad as if it's already minced. So, already peeled, but I'm going to throw some trash because that is disgusting. Now, on to, I'm going to rinse my hands really quick because I'm very sticky from the garlic dish towel. Um, so, on to our vinaigrette. We are going to pour in some vinegar. Now, those of you who love measurements, I'm very sorry. I don't have measurements for this recipe, but I do have proportions. In general, vinaigrettes are one-fourth um one part acid to three parts oil now again everything in cooking is however you want it to be whatever tastes good to you because for instance for me i don't really like super oily dressings i like really not pungent but tart and acidic dressings so i normally use a little more um vinegar or acid than most people but generally like a good rule of thumb if you want to make a batch for a couple a couple weeks is like a fourth of a cup of acid to three-fourths of a cup of oil. So we have our acid and we have our garlic in our bowl. Again, I just moved in, so I don't have to, but this bowl should be a little more rounded, not this like serving bowl, but you know, work with what you got, real life cooking, there we go. Emulsifier. Now, I'm using mustard. We wanna put in about, if you think about, as if you're doing one-fourth of a cup of acid to three-fourths of a cup oil, you wanna think chicken. of, yes? Chicken. Oh, chicken, thank you. So we're gonna pause on our vinaigrette really quickly and check our chicken. So, probably the biggest question on everyone's minds who sorta of cooks, how do you know when chicken's done? Um, no, we're not gonna cut it open and tell. Um, if you've been cooking for a long time, you can normally tell by how it feels. Like I can tell this part down here is a little more firm, so it's done. But this part, ooh, that part squirted out some more juices. Um, this part up here is very like bouncy, like trampoline, so I know it's not done. But if you are not an avid cook, I'm gonna go ahead and rinse off my hands. If you are not an avid cook, the only way to really tell besides cutting into your chicken is a food thermometer. This is not a very expensive tool. If you want the most expensive thermometer on the market, which is also the best, it's called a Thermapen. It's a very good investment. Put it on your Christmas list, birthday gift. Um, no, I do not work for them, but it really is the best thing. Um, I used to work for America's Test Kitchen and they tested everything. So like I kind of drank their Kool-Aid and they test everything, they throw it against the wall. They're like, yes, this is best. So, and, but not only did I hear it from them, I used it often, I cook often. And I know it gives it very easy to read. You can use it for candies, you can use it for chocolates, or the candies and chocolates. 
can use it for candies, you can use it for oil, you can use it for meats. So what I'm gonna do when I temp my, um, temp my protein is I'm going to not stick it on the top or the bottom because obviously that's where all the heat has been coming from. I'm gonna stick it in the side. So I'm just gonna stick mm -hmm. my chicken in, or stick the, not stick the chicken in, stick the thermometer in the side and it is reading at about, because I'm real television, would be zooming in right now. I can lie to you. Oh, it's 165, perfect. No, just kidding. Um, it is at about one, it's still about 123. So obviously it's not done because everyone knows the temperature chicken is done at. <laughs> one something. Our technological guru does not know what the temperature is. It's 165. I was gonna say that. 165 yeah. is the temperature you're looking for chicken. Um, anything below that, you're risking salmonella. Anything above that is your chicken's gonna be tough. Um, you probably have like a five degree radius, but you really don't want to go over 165. Over like 170 when you're cooking chicken. I'm gonna raise up the temperature just a little. All right. So let's give that another three to five minutes. Stop oh, me at four. Okay. Three to five minutes is four. Yes. Someone else has a question. question. How much red wine vinegar did you use in that bowl? They were checking that chicken, their chicken, and they missed that part. Oh, sorry. So I don't always measure um, my red wine vinegar, but at home, you can use a fourth of a cup of red wine vinegar. Uh, and then we're going to use three fourths of a cup of oil. But before we add in our oil, we are going to add in our mustard. Now, again, I said I don't like to use measurements, but when you think of adding in your emulsifier, think of about a tablespoon. One, one reason I don't like to measure things out is because it's another thing to wash. Um, I don't want to wash a tablespoon. Um, those crevices are like annoying. So, but if you think of it in a visual effect, it's about the size of an egg yolk. Like if you open up an egg, how big an egg yolk is, that's about a tablespoon. So I'm gonna just eyeball it. I'll show you guys. Can you see inside my bowl? <laughs> that looks mm, that looks so beautiful. Pro I promise you it'll taste really good. Um, so we have our garlic, we have our mustard, and we are just going and we have our vinegar, and we're gonna just go ahead and whisk that around, just to incorporate everything. Oh, I totally forgot. I told you guys to buy Worcestershire sauce, and I didn't take it out. We're also gonna add a little bit of Worcestershire sauce. Now we're only gonna add a couple of dashes. This is just gonna add a depth of flavor to our vinaigrette that wouldn't necessarily, my chicken started boiling too, too aggressively back here. I'm gonna turn it down. Cooking is active. You always have to be aware of what's happening around you. Um, so this is basically, it's made with um, anchovies and it has like, it just adds like a nice dimension to your um, dressing that you ne wouldn't necessarily have. So we're gonna give it about two dashes of that. That was about five, but you know. <laughs> It'll have a stronger, smokier flavor. If you're not familiar with Worcestershire sauce or Worcestershire, which one is it? Worcestershire. 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 Worcestershire sauce. <laughs> um, go ahead and taste it before you add into your vinaigrette and see if you even like it. Because I'm big, um, I like really want to encourage you to taste everything before you put it in. Because if you don't like it, just omit it. Like you don't need it in this vinaigrette. This is a total loosey goosey kind of recipe. Um, so we're going to put our Worcestershire sauce in. Worcestershire sauce. <laughs> yeah, you got it. And I remember I also told you guys if you needed honey mm -hmm. or if you wanted honey or sugar. This is the time you would add that in. It's just going to round out the flavors a little bit more if you're staying away from sugar like I'm attempting to do for Aww. this month. <laughs> I'm sad. Tutti Lyle is upset because she wants to eat this. Um, so if you're staying away from sugar, uh, you don't need to add it in, but I would add about a teaspoon in of sugar. Um, and it's just going to round out all those flavors and make it um, a little sweeter, obviously. And the honey will make it less sweet than the sugar. But you can use any kind of sweetener you want. Now that we have all these things combined, it looks like a lovely little murky mess. Um, we also want to add in a little bit of salt and pepper at this moment. But we don't need to season it all the way like it's going to be done because we can always season it again at the end. Always add a little bit and then season more heavily at the end if you need it. So now, oil. This is the number one thing, my number one mistake people make when they're making vinaigrettes at home. They take their oil and they literally just like pour it in. If I was like not in my own house, I would just pour a huge stream out right now, but I don't want to clean that up later. So um, you don't actually, I can show you in a bowl. Hmm, look at me, it's getting smart. It's been four minutes. Oh, oh, let's check our chicken really quick. Again, thermometer into the side of our chicken. Oh. Get it to move on. That's a 
so great about the Thurman pin, you just flip it open and it turns on. You don't even have to press a button. Ooh, we are at, and the Thurman pin is so much faster than this little thermometer. Yeah, thermometer. We are at about 140, so we still have a little bit more time left to go. Go ahead and put that in. Um, five minutes, please, on the clock. Five minutes. Yes. All right, so most people, when they make vinaigrettes, they pour their oil like that. No, please do not. This is a gentle, finessing situation that we're going to do with our oil. It's actually easier if you have something with a spout. I'm going to do it without a spout since I didn't tell you guys to bring this. But um, a spout makes it your pouring ability a little easier. It's a little easier to control. Also, we are going to be whisking the entire time we are pouring in our oil. So you don't have three hands to hold the bowl, whisk, and pour in your oil. Or maybe you have a friend that's helping you cook. But that's kind of weird to like hold a bowl. Whatever. <laughs> um, the easiest way to do this at home is to take a towel. Go ahead and put that around your bowl. Actually, this bowl kind of works out for this because it has a flat surface. It's not so rounded, so it's not going to move around quite as much. But if you make a little nest for your bowl, it won't move around as you whisk. So easy tip since you don't have three arms. If you do, you might want to see a doctor. <laughs> All right, so we're going to squeeze. We're going to squeeze. We're going to drip, literally drip our oil in like this. Like seriously, that was just too much. And we're going to whisk constantly the whole time I'm dripping in oil we're gonna drip we're gonna whisk and we're not gonna whisk round and around and around like that we're gonna whisk more side to side um, the scientists at America's Test Kitchen told me that that actually distributes and emulsifies the molecules better so I'll trust them on that um so dripping it in now if you get big pools of oil on top of your vinegar, stop pouring in your oil and just whisk those, whisk those into your vinegar. Question. Question. Can you use a regular blender when adding oil? Yes. So I'm showing you the old fashioned way in the times or when you live in New York and don't have a lot of equipment. Actually, I do have a blender, but um, you can use a blender when you're doing this to stream in your oil. It actually makes it really easy. Um, a food processor as well. But I will say that a lot of times when you're doing that with a blender, um, it gives a sort of off taste to your like garlic or your alliums. Um, so it won't necessarily, I mean, maybe it won't taste different to you, but to a trained mouth, it tastes just a little bit different. But if you figure the worth is, the, the work is, the work is not worth the little tiny bit of taste. Question? Um, how do you feel about shaking it in a jar? Shaking it in a jar is cool, but it'll never be completely emulsified as if you, um, as if you do it like this, because essentially you can't pour and shake at the same time. So you're gonna, oh my chicken, so aggressive. The proteins are getting tight back here. Two more minutes. Um, if you pour, essentially you can't pour and shake at the same time. So you want to make sure that, um, so you're going to have two layers always. So they're always going to separate back out. Um, they're never going to be completely emulsified. Whereas you can see here, or you can't see, I have to walk around my island. This is getting pretty emulsified. There's not two different layers. Ooh, there we go. Not two different layers down there. I'm going to add in a little more oil. Now, like I said, woo, um, this recipe is completely interchangeable, and that's why I wanted to start with this recipe um, at, on my first rest, on my first episode because you can play around with this. You can use lemon juice, and you can use extra virgin olive oil. You can use um, flaxseed oil. You can do a blend of oils. You can use avocado oil, which I've just started experimenting with because they say it's really healthy for you. I don't know if I like the taste quite yet, um, but you can use any kind of oil, any kind of you can use garlic, you can use leeks, you can use shallots. Shallots are really nice. They're like a cross, well not really cross, but they're like a sweeter onion. Um, it's really a fun little thing you can play around with and you can play around with your ingredients in your salad. All right, just a little bit more oil. Towards the end, I'm gonna check my chicken. Towards the end, you can pour in your oil a little more aggressively and I hesitate to say that because I really don't want you to have a unemulsified vinaigrette. 
As you can see, I'm gonna just pour this into my measuring cup. I'm gonna turn off my chicken because I'm pretty sure it's done. So you can actually see there's not two layers here. Ta-da! Can you see? No, it's stuck. Don't worry, I'll show you. So we have a nice emulsified vinaigrette here. It's not two layers. Perfect. Um, what did I not do with this vinaigrette though before I poured it in here? I didn't taste it. You always have to taste your food as you're going along because hmm, it's a little sour. So maybe I could add in that sugar, but tasting vinaigrettes, you actually always want to taste it with what are you going to eat it on? You're not going to just drink vinaigrette. You're going to eat it on your lettuce. Tastes better now. It does need some pepper and it does need a little bit of salt. So we'll add those things in and then we'll just set this aside. Now, let's move this dirty dish. We will check our chicken. I'm thinking it's done this time. Let's see. And while our chicken thermometer, our slow chicken thermometer is going, we're gonna go ahead and clear this up and bring over our ingredients for our chickpea salad, our Greek chickpea salad. Hmm, we have our tomatoes and we have our cucumbers. Well, cucumber, you just need one. Don't freak out, you only need one. Um, our chickpeas, parsley, uh, lemon, and my favorite part, the cheese, feta cheese. Um, I got this in a big thing from Costco and this is how I keep it now. But um, yeah, feta cheese, we'll get more into that later. It's like my favorite thing in the whole world, cheese in general. Uh, we are still two degrees away, but I'm not going to continue to boil my chicken because if I just leave it on here, the residual heat should finish cooking it, should finish cooking it. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started on our salad. I need a bowl for my salad. There we go. So we will start with our cucumber, two cucumbers. Um, I told you guys to get an English cucumber, which is the one wrapped in plastic that costs like five million dollars. Just kidding. It costs like three dollars maybe as opposed to this, which is like you can get three for 99 cents. And you might have been in the store like, why do you want to buy this expensive cucumber? Like, I can get a million of these for the price of one. Because this cucumber is superior, I promise you. Um, this American cucumber has very, very waxy skin, which is why it doesn't have any plastic around it. It doesn't need any protection. It has its own built-in protection. So to use this cucumber, you actually need to peel it, um, which is a whole nother step and a whole nother thing you have to wash. And you have to seed it out. Now you don't, these are like not have tos, but it's more appetable if you see, is appetable a word? I feel like I made that up. Appetable? Appetizing? More appetizing. Yeah, that's a word. I recognize that word. <laughs> more appetizing. <laughs> if you peel it and seed it, um, which is a whole nother, it's just more steps. So it's up to you. And normally the flesh of this cucumber um, isn't as like crunchy and delicious as the um, English cucumber. I'm not saying, I'm not, yeah, this is, I grew up on these and then I found this when I was like 18. I was like, mom, what have you been doing with my whole life? <laughs> Your mom's <alive>. Hi mom. <laughs> Thanks for cleaning the kitchen when I was a kid. <laughs> All right, so. We are going to cut only what we need of this cucumber. We don't, now if you're cooking for more than two people or more, from, more than one person, again, we're not using complete recipes, you can use whatever, however much amount you want. If you want your salad to be really cucumbery, use the whole thing. Um, but you do wanna make sure you're having a balance. So the only thing that's really measured here is our chickpeas. So I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna rinse these out. Now, again, this is real life, so I didn't wanna open, mm, Course, that life. happens to be real life. I have to break out the can opener that I hope I own. Oh, it's in this drawer. That's stuck. Real life, man. Here we go, can opener. Now, um, you can, so chickpeas in a can or beans in general in a can are great things if you're in a rush or don't have a time to cook beans for like two hours. Uh, the only thing you really need to do to these is rinse them off. Um, I, I love just having a can and throwing them into salads. Just go ahead and open that. Notice I use a butter knife, not my amazing sharp chef knife to like open a can. Um, it really 
makes me very sad when I see people use their nice knife to do like weird things like, oh, let's cut the Christmas tree or let's, no, this knife is only for cutting in the kitchen. I'm so glad I, I mean, I love my old roommates, but I'm so glad that <laughs> my boyfriend knows not to touch my knives. <laughs> um, all right, so you can, you just want to rinse them out, which if you have a strainer, awesome, rinse them out in your strainer. But again, I'm lazy, I don't like to do dishes. So I just like to rinse them out straight in the can. I just pour this out, I use the lid as a thing. I pour it out and I rinse it out with the water until the water runs clear. So just rinse that out. Now, chickpeas are an excellent source of protein. And they're quite delicious. They're the main component in hummus, if you like hummus. So I just literally open, you can't see me, but I'm just, using the lid as a, as a strainer and pouring out the liquid. And then I'm just gonna put them directly, again, butter knife, not my finger, because I like my finger, and not my chef knife, because I like my chef knife, and pour those directly into the bowl. So, of course I recycle, mom. Um, <laughs> so, uh, we have our chickpeas. So this is the portion of chickpeas that we have. So we wanna have pretty much equal proportions of everything. So that's what I'm gonna think of when I'm cutting off my cucumber. So we are going to, I'll probably use about half of this. Just go ahead and cut. Now the rest of my cucumber that I'm not using, I'm gonna keep it in this plastic. I don't wanna unwrap the whole thing because this again is a protective layer of our cucumber and it's gonna stay better in your fridge um, with the plastic wrap on. Go ahead and move that out of the way. Now, we wanna make sure we remove the plastic from this cucumber. And now this is where you get creative. I'm gonna just rinse this off. That's not where you get creative, the rinsing off. But you can cut your cucumber however you want. Isn't that amazing? Um, now for those of you that want direction, you can follow my lead. Um, but you can just, you can either, I would suggest for this salad to keep them like a little bit bigger than the chickpea. Uh, but you could slice them if, if that's your thing, slice your cucumber or whatever. But to cut them for the way that I suggest for this recipe, you're gonna wanna just go ahead and slice it in half. So you have two little halves. And then I'm gonna slice the half in half. So then I have two little planks. And then I'm going to turn those two planks on their sides or on flat, obviously on the flat surface, not the rolling around surface. So you wanna make your life easier. And then I'm going to just cut them into I don't know what kind of shape this is. What would you call it? It's like a half moon and half. Yeah, that works. Half moon and half. Technical. Half, half moon. Yeah. Um, so they're about this big. But again, you can cut them. Let me get closer to you. You can cut them however you would like. All right, so let's just do the other one now. Move that to the side. Cut this in half. Half moon shape, half, half moons. <laughs> Again, when you're chopping something, you want to rock your knife, not hack it. What you're, you don't you want your food to taste good. You want to be nice to your food while you're cooking with it. Put those into our bowl, just like so. Now we will do our tomatoes. I'm gonna just rinse these off. Um, so I told you guys to get great cherry tomatoes. Um, so you might have noticed. There's two different kinds of little tomatoes. Basically, you just needed little tomatoes. Um, but there's two different kinds of little tomatoes in the store. There's grape tomatoes and cherry tomatoes. Um, and they're not, they, they're not equal, actually, at all, even though they have the same color skin. Hmm. Um, they, uh, grape tomatoes actually have a thicker skin, and um, they, uh, they're cheaper. <laughs> Don't laugh at me over there. <laughs> They're cheaper because they have a thicker skin and they last longer in stores. Of course, stores like things that last longer. Um, and your cherry tomatoes are not going to uh, last as long necessarily. Um, so we're just gonna cut these in half. I notice a lot of people that don't like tomatoes or whole tomatoes. Most people don't like these like bursting in their mouth one moment. Um, but they'll eat a cherry tomato or a grape tomato when it's cut in half. I don't know how it magically changes, but somehow it does. So we're gonna cut these in half. Yes, question? Uh, is it okay if you leave the chicken covered? Yes, it is totally fine. My chicken is off, actually. Um, like I said, it wasn't quite at temperature, so I just wanted to leave it in that warm area so it's gonna do some carryover cooking and get to the temperature that I need it to be. All right, so that's about enough tomatoes. We're actually coming to the end of tomato season. 
Um, so yay if you don't like tomatoes. Crying if you do like tomatoes. Um, summer is prime tomato season. You also want to make sure because of the skin of your tomato, you're normally eating the skin. You want to try to buy tomatoes that are organic. Um, it's one of those things that it's worth the extra price to pay for the organic. All right. Finally, well not finally, we have three more ingredients. We have our parsley. Now, I'm sure most of you have this problem of buying herbs because look, why, who in the earth would need this much parsley unless you're cooking for like a family of, I don't know. 35, yeah, I don't know. It's like a tree. I could put this as one of my plants in my living room. Um, but the easiest way to keep your herbs at home is actually to have a little paper towel, wrap them up in your paper towel, and then put them in a Ziploc bag and keep them in your crisper. That is um, the best way to keep your herbs. Something like parsley, which is a little more hardier than like a mint or a dill, can actually last like up to two weeks if you do it that way. Um, I still don't know if I'm going to use all this parsley in two weeks, but it lasts longer than um, if you just were to throw your herbs directly in there. So I'm going to just take about a bunch of parsley. This is just to add freshness. Contrary to popular belief, parsley is not just a garnish. Um, it does actually add a flavor. Uh, it tastes, <laughs> this is going to sound so appetizing, it tastes like grass. <laughs> But like a good grass, like, you know, like a spring day grass, like, oh yeah, mm -hmm. I see you're imagining spring right now, you're imagining part, yeah, woo, our feta cheese just fell, it's okay, I have more. Um, so, we're going to rinse off our parsley, because I didn't actually wash this before I put it in my bag, so I'm going to rinse off my parsley, and I want to make sure it's pretty dry. Now, if you want to make your life more efficient at home, remove all this parsley, uh, if you want to make your life more efficient at home instead of having to rinse your herbs every single time, you can rinse all your herbs when you first get them home, but you need to make sure they're basically bone dry before you put them into that plastic um, wrap because or plastic bag because the moisture is going to make it what make it not so great. It's going to like mold easily. So my suggestion is to throw it in a salad spinner or lay it on paper towels and really really make sure it's dry. Mm. Now. To chop parsley, another thing people love to be like, ha, 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 and then it's like so, it seems so difficult to chop it. Um, in culinary school, and actually when I worked at Sur La Table, we tell everyone to take the stems off of the parsley. That's nice, but it's a lot of work, and this is real life. So, we're not going to take our stems off of parsley, but if you saw when I broke off my parsley, um, I tried to remove as much of the stem as possible. The only reason that is, it's a, like it's not going to be the exact same texture as the rest of the parsley, and it's going to have a more grassy flavor. So if you really, if you're not a fan of parsley, you want to remove those stems. Um, if you're just like trying it out, you're like, oh, she said it's going to be good, then you want to remove the stems. If you don't really mind the flavor, you like a nice, bright, like earthy flavor in the background, keep it all together. Now, when we're chopping our herbs, we want to go ahead and bunch them all together. Seems kind of counterintuitive. We're going to bunch them like this. And then I'm going to run my knife as close together. I'm going to make cuts as close together as possible through this parsley. So, so when I finish, I'm going to have something that's already kind of uniform that's going to be easier to mince up later. Again, I'm protecting my fingers. What's the question? Question. Yes. Is there a difference between Italian parsley versus curly parsley? Yes, there is. So Italian parsley is what I have. It's also known as flat leaf parsley. Um, and flat leaf parsley is what the, pref the preferred parsley of most people, I would say. It has, it's, has a better texture, uh, my preferred too. It has a better texture and it's not as grassy flavored. I'm just, I need another word besides grassy to, to describe <laughs> parsley, but it's not as like in your face assertive normally as um, your curly parsley. And then once I have that already pretty uniform, that's when I'm going to run my knife straight through, just back and forth. Flat leaf parsley, I feel like maybe because I live in New York City or I just shop for rich people now, like most of the stores, flat leaf parsley is very avail widely available. But growing up, I don't really remember seeing flat leaf parsley. Maybe it wasn't really a thing in the 90s. I don't know. Not that I was like going grocery shop shopping by myself, but who knows. But I know um, curly parsley was like a very big garnish in the 80s, so. And it, you, you can chew on it to freshen your breath. Mm. So, 
our parsley. Now, when we're chopping our parsley, I always tell people you want to be, you want to have it minced enough so if it got stuck in your teeth, it wouldn't be so embarrassing like there's not a whole leaf like hanging out of your mouth. But you don't want to mince it so much that you have like a green lawnmower grass stain on your cutting board. Um, and then I'm just going to lift this up and place it in here. And another good note, if you are making anything in life that involves herbs, you normally, oh, this is really bothering me. I need to buy a bench scraper next time. It's okay when I'm doing it by myself at home, just scraping my knife away. But when I'm like instructing people, you need a bench scraper. You don't want to be scraping your knife because it's really dulling your knife. Um, but when you're cooking at home uh, and you're using herbs, you want to make sure that you're, or if you can, you want to try to do the herbs last because look what happens to your cutting board. It's really hard to clean off those herbs as opposed to like the cucumber didn't make huge mess, the tomato didn't make huge mess. The herbs should go last. All right, so that's basically everything in our salad. I'm gonna go ahead and wipe down my cutting board. And I'll wipe down my knife too. Someone wants to know about buying chopped parsley, pre-chopped parsley. What do you think? I'm kidding. <laughs> pre-chopped parsley, anything pre-chopped, honestly, in the store, unless you're like super short on time, as soon as something's chopped up, it's beginning to go bad. Uh, just like when you cut a flower, it's starting to go bad. Um, it's not, unless you're going to use all of it, like you're cooking for like 15 people and you really don't want to spend your time chopping parsley, um, I really highly suggest to chop your own parsley uh, because if you buy chopped parsley and you're not using it all, like two days in the fridge is probably going to go bad. So strongly suggest against, but if you're cooking for a large party, hey, I sure cut too sometimes. But if you're only cooking for one or two people, four people, chop your own parsley. All right. How long does the salad last? This salad, depending on how strong your stomach is, no. <laughs> Someone asked how long, I don't know if you heard, Titi, um, how long the salad would last. Uh, this salad should last about four days, five days. Uh, I cooked for a family where I, I'm just seasoning the salt and pepper. I cooked for a family once where I came one day a week and I made all their meals for the week. And like I would come the next Tuesday and they'd still be eating it. So really, it's really up to you. Um, but I would safely eat this after four days. I actually personally hate leftovers. Yes. Uh, in regards to cutting boards, do you prefer wooden, plastic, does it matter? Cutting boards. I like plastic cutting boards. Wooden cutting boards are a little more difficult to take care of. So plastic is the way to go, especially ones you can just throw in the dishwasher. Sorry, New Yorkers probably don't have a dishwasher. But um, uh, yeah, plastic is the way to go. And it is a good idea to keep two different cutting boards for your like meats and things and your vegetables. I do have a wooden cutting board and like in my fancy houses I cook in, they have wooden cutting boards, but I normally just use those for like fruit because they're easy to clean off rather than the like hard, heavy duty um, cooking or cutting that I'm doing. Now, we just need to add a couple more ingredients to this. We're gonna drizzle in some olive oil. Now, depending on how juicy you like this, I would say about up to a fourth of a cup of olive oil. And then we're going to add in some lemon juice. Again, up to your taste, not mine. I'm not eating your food. I'm only eating my own. So I'm probably going to add most of this lemon. Also, if you do have a microplane, sorry, I didn't warn you before, but now you're all going to go get one so you're prepared for next time. Some lemon zest in here will be awesome. Another use for your microplane. It's not a one-use tool, not a one-trick pony. Um, when you are zesting a lemon, you want to make sure that you're not like going so hard because you don't want to get that white pith in there because that's a little bitter that out now we will combine this together with our spoon looks so this salad is like so beautiful smell the aromas mm, I can <laughs> eat that right <laughs> yeah you can have a taste maybe Whoa. um so you can see it's like very bright and beautiful it's perfect for summer because that's over now down here we got you um the only thing that could make this salad better is are feta cheese, of course. Now, of course you can omit cheese, uh, the feta cheese if you don't like cheese. Who are you if you don't like cheese? Just kidding. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and just crumble some of that in. As much or as, as little as you want. I'll probably use this whole chunk. There we go. And I'm going to just mix that around. Looks beautiful. I got so excited about the cheese, I forgot to squeeze in my lemon. So we're gonna go ahead and, where is my lemon? Here we are. 
Now, a note, when you're trying to get the most juice out of a citrus fruit, you don't necessarily want to cut, cut it, bless you, you, horizontally. You actually want to cut it a little bit off center and then off center again. Ooh, this is a beautiful lemon. This lemon made me really excited. It has no seeds. I hate seeds. It just makes it harder to squeeze out. So I have three different pieces of lemon. This is a really good technique um, when you have a lime too because limes are really hard to juice. And so you see how much juice we get on this. This is a really juicy lemon, as I said, but it is a better technique than just cutting it in half. Actually, I only might need half of it now. So go. Is this keto friendly? Is this keto friendly? No. Hmm. I'm actually experimenting with keto and hating my life. Uh, keto people cannot eat beans. No carbs. Um, chickpeas. Chickpeas have, yes, carbs. But if you remove the chickpeas, actually someone asked me on Instagram, um, their husband didn't like chickpeas. You can totally make the salad without chickpeas and it would be just as delicious. Um, yeah, and the longer it sits, if you like things a little more mushy and less crispy, the longer it sits, the more um, like mushy it's gonna become. Yes, we have a question and I'm gonna taste this. Do you like herb feta for the salad or would that be overpowering? Um. No, it wouldn't be overpowering. Herb feta for this salad, sorry, it's really good. Um, if you like the herbs inside of the feta, um, it definitely wouldn't be overpowering in anything. This is a salad, again, that you can play around with. Um, actually, I wanted to mention about feta cheese. Actually, I'm gonna add a little bit more lemon juice to this. About the feta cheese, if you can find the feta cheese that is like in water, like moving around in water, that's the best kind of feta cheese. It's like creamy and delicious. Um, rather than like, I don't know, like the regular kind, what's it called, like Aikos or something like that, um, that's a little harder. I mean, it really is a matter of preference, but if you haven't tried the kind in the water, try it next time. Um, I know Whole Foods sells some just like that, so make sure you try that. All right, so we have our chickpea salad. We have, all we have do, left to do is eat. We have our chickpea salad. We have, we have our salad greens. Question, yes. What kind of salt are you using? I am using <laughs> the salt that was left over in my old house. But in general, I would like to use, I like to use kosher salt. Um, it, the flakes actually distribute more evenly, in my opinion. And um, it absorbs into your food a little bit better than like iodized salt, which I'm currently using. But it's not my favorite thing to use. I definitely prefer kosher salt or sea salt, um, that kind in a blue bin that's like baleen salt. I really like that one as well. All right, so we have our salad greens of your choice. These are mixed spring greens. Uh, if I had my choice, I'd really have romaine. It's my favorite salad green. But we have our salad greens here. Um, a note on salad greens, Unle the only kind of salad greens you really wanna buy in like a bag prepackaged are spring greens just like this and make sure you like completely observe to make sure there's no like milk. Um, old pieces of lettuce or anything like that. One of my least favorite tasks when I was a kid was my mom would give me the big thing from Costco and be like, can you go through, not, it actually wasn't the can. It was like, go through this and find all the bad pieces. It's like the worst job in life, so meticulous. I would just be like, oh yeah, it's all bad. No, we don't want to eat this. Um, so spring greens are the only kind of greens you want to buy in a bag, arugula you want to buy in a bag. You never really, just like garlic, just like parsley, you never really want to buy greens that are already chopped up because then as soon as they're chopped they start to go bad so um spring greens i have here i'm gonna get my vinaigrette oh look at this magic it hasn't even separated magical right and we have our chicken our nice and juicy but browned chicken we'll take this out Ooh, we'll take this out and we will slice this up or just I'm gonna slice it on a bias, which just means, bias? just means turning your knife on an angle and slicing it through just like this. Oh, so juicy. Mm. What about Himalayan salt? One moment, please. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna plate this up. So I'm gonna put a little bit of dressing. Now, if you like salad soup, Go ahead and pour all this dressing on here. But I do not recommend salad soup. We're eating salad. So you wanna drizzle it on just a little at a time. Maybe about that much. 
and then we'll just toss it together with your hands or tongs make the job a little cleaner easier and we'll go ahead and place that on our plate salad greens are something that you know as young adults or adults we like to keep in our fridge and pretend we're gonna eat when you have an amazing salad dressing in your fridge you're definitely gonna want to eat salad greens more we're gonna go ahead and put some of our chickpea Greek feta salad on here looking gorgeous and we'll go ahead and lay out some of our chicken now again a lot of this stuff you can um, repurpose throughout the whole week so your chicken you can just leave this in your fridge slice it up add it to a taco add it to a sandwich add it to a salad um, it's really just a great thing eat it with barbecue sauce really great thing to have in your fridge this is like a salad that you could get from Whole Foods but you made it yourself so you know exactly what's in it um, and it'll last like three to four days and it's a, a great snack when you look in your fridge and you're like oh this is already ready-made and here we have our complete meal if you have been cooking along with me and you are not caught up um, there's a thing called rewind <laughs> um, but thank you so much for joining me on my first real-life cooking episode um, I'm Kathleen and make sure to ask any questions. Oh, one moment. Someone asked about Himalayan salt. I want to make sure I answer that question. Um, Himalayan salt is great. It's supposedly healthy for you, healthier. I'm not a nutritionist, so I don't want to say it's like amazingly healthy for you, but Himalayan salt is great, but it is more expensive. So I wouldn't use it in applications like boiling pasta or something that requires, um, like a lot of salt, maybe something like a vinaigrette where you're not cooking it at all. But um, for sure, your uh, Himalayan salt is it's good, but it's really expensive. So if you don't, if you're using a lot of salt, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, also, if you're a saucy person like me, this vinaigrette is great even more on your chicken. Or if you make fish throughout the week, you can use your vinaigrettes on your fish. You can add herbs to your vinaigrette. Really, I just want you to play around and have fun in the kitchen. And look, how much time have we been on? about an hour and two minutes Ooh, we've been on for an hour so in about an hour i've been talking to you i've been cooking and we have made a complete meal i hope you join me next week if you have any questions please put them below dm me talk to me um let me know what you want to see on here i'm going to have special guests coming up in the future if you want to be on the show let me know thank you so much for watching and have a great weekend I don't know how to end it. Oh, finish. <laughs> Bye, guys.